Hi, all. Welcome to the uh, special session two of the IST uh, conference. I have the honor of introducing our speaker for this special session. Uh, Dr. Pahiskar is a researcher at the John Garrick Institute for Risk Sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Dr. Pariskar has a PhD in energy systems engineering. Her specialties are modeling, prognostic health monitoring, and operation optimization of complex systems. She has an extensive background in dynamic probabilistic modeling assessment and risk-based decision support tools for complex energy systems. She has a pre-recorded uh, session today that we will go ahead and start. And then we may have some time for maybe one or two questions. So we ask you to please place those questions into the chat and then we will um, facilitate them during the uh, Q&A. Welcome to the workshop on uh, long-term operation and design optimization of complex system. My name is Saranam Parhiskar, and I'm a research scientist at John Garrick Research Institute for Risk Sciences uh, at UCLA. So uh, as you may know, materials degrade over time because of different type of degradation mechanisms. We could have mechanical degradation mechanisms, chemical, electrochemical, and other type of degradation mechanism that can happen in uh, a system. Material degradation can result in performance deterioration. So over time, the performance of our system deteriorates and we don't have the same performance uh, as we had in, at the beginning of system operation, at the initial time of system operation. But the good news is that the operating conditions and maintenance intervals affect this degradation rates and this performance deterioration. So if we are able to optimize, we could be able to optimize the operating conditions and maintenance intervals, then we can control the degradation rate. We can control the performance deterioration of our system. And as a result, we could reach uh, an optimal point that results in the a desired condition that we have. For example, we want, if we want to maximize the profit over time, then we can optimize the operating conditions and control the degradation mechanisms that results in maximum profit in long-term operation, not at one time. So in this lecture, in this workshop, I will try to present a framework for you that you can implement this framework to any type of complex systems and you will be able to optimize the operating condition and maintenance interval of your complex energy systems in a way that you achieve your uh, goal. The, the goal is the objective function that we have for our system. I will present a case study as well to show how we should implement the framework and different applications. So here the case study is a type of fuel cell. Uh, it's solid oxide fuel cell, SOFC, that I implement the framework on that and you can see the results that if we implement the framework, the degradation based optimization, how the optimal operating conditions is different uh, from a situation that we don't consider degradation mechanisms in our optimization process. I will compare these two results and you can see the effectiveness of degradation based optimization framework. So let's share the screen and start. When we want to model a system, we want to simulate its behavior. So when we have some inputs and we use the model, we should be able to predict the output. But when our model is not dependent on degradation mechanisms, then over time, we have the same output. The output here is presented as a performance. So over time, we have a constant output. 
you may have used different models for uh, modeling your energy system or your complex system. And if you don't consider the degradation mechanism, for sure over time, you will have the same performance with the same input, with the same operating and environmental conditions. However, we have degradation mechanisms in reality. So performance deteriorates over time and degradation mechan because of degradation mechanisms. If you try to identify the degradation mechanism in our complex system, it will help us to evaluate the performance of our energy system more accurately over time. But what is the degradation mechanism? If I want to define it, we can say that it is a gradual and irreversible accumulation of damage that occurs during a system life cycle. And we have two types of degradation mechanisms. One of them is recoverable degradation, and the other one is non-recoverable degradation. Examples of recoverable degradation are clogging, scaling, and belt up of deposits on the working surface. So in this type of degradation, when system is operating, we are able to remove the degradation, the, the result of degradation that can, could be clogging or whatever. During system operation, we are able to recover our system. But in non-recoverable ones, the examples are tear or loss of working surface, corrosion, oxidation, erosion. You can see that it's not possible during operation of the system, we remove the corrosion, we remove the erosion of the system. So we need system, we need the system to, we need to turn off the system uh, and system should go to maintenance. And as a result, we call it non-recoverable. It means system as a shutdown period that it goes to maintenance. And we perform some maintenance, for example, we remove, replace some part, and then system can go back to the operation and the degradation mechanisms is recovered. So this non-recoverable still we can recover it, but it's not during the operation of the system. So this degradation mechanisms will result in performance deterioration and the performance deterioration can result in increasing cost over time. The operating cost, as you can see, will increase. And the reason is that if we want to have a constant performance, the output of the system, then we should consume more fuels. We, we need more fuel to have the same performance over time. As a result, the cost of fuel will increase. In addition, we have maintenance costs as well. After a period, we should system should go to maintenance. And as I said, in the maintenance, we recover non-recoverable degradation mechanisms and system can operate with the same or a part of uh, the operating condition and the performance that it had at the beginning. It goes back with a percentage, it depends on the maintenance efficiency, it starts again from the initial point. And again, we have increasing cost and we have maintenance cost. In addition, we can say that income will decrease as well because if we want to have a constant fuel input, then as performance deteriorates over time, therefore, for example, the performance could be power generation. Then we have less power generated, then we can make less money because of the performance, it could be power. And as a result, the income will decrease as well. So in this two graph, you can see the financial effect of degradation mechanisms in long-term operation. One, in, 
important point is that operating conditions and environmental conditions affect degradation rate. So with different operating conditions of the system, we could have different operate, different degradation rate and different performance deterioration rate over time, as you can see here. So it, it means that by optimizing operating conditions, sometimes we are not able to optimize the environmental condition because the location of the system and all the environmental conditions are our constraints and we have that limitation and we don't have a choice to select the environmental condition. But uh, we most of the time we can change and control the operating condition of the system. As a result, by optimizing the operating condition, we can control the degradation rate and we can control the performance deterioration rate as well. As a result, for example, we can say as the timeline of the system, my timeline is here. Therefore, for example, the optimal operating condition for my system would be For example, A star, B star, C star, and each of these can be different operating conditions. For example, temperature, pressure, or whatever we have in our system that results in optimal performance deterioration. Here you can see an example of the application of degradation-based operation optimization. Uh, ABB is, here you can see, ABB is a company uh, operating mainly in power, heavy electrical uh, equipment and automation technology areas. So uh, this company in 2006 started using Optimax software uh, and in, uh, the company implemented the software for different plants and units, power plants and other plants that they had and they tried to see the results of implementing Optimax and changing the operating condition. So as you can see, They implement the Optimax to a plant, uh, which was 675, and it was in the US, and they reported yearly saving of 140K by improving unit efficiency and availability. In another example, a large utility in US reported significantly reduction of NOx and carbon in ash, while simultaneously improving heat rate and maintaining the CO level, which can be considered for environmental factors, pollution. And in addition, another result that they got was a plan for combined power generation and desalination in the Middle East that has achieved more than 4% of total saving through Optimax process. Uh, which optimized the load and the availability again of the system. So you can see that we have the degradation-based optimization models in industry as well. And we have different softwares that they are using in different plants and different power plants. The framework that ABB company is used and the framework that I want to present today has three main advantages. One of the main advantages is that it considers the change in cost and income over time because of degradation mechanisms. The second one is that so in current version, in most of the models that we are using, we consider maintenance cost as a constant number after a specific interval. So for example, we say after two years, we have maintenance, we should have a maintenance for our gas turbine 
and the price would be whatever. But it's a constant number and after a specific interval. However, in this framework, we don't consider a constant number and we try to split the amount of maintenance to different intervals. For example, it could be monthly, it could be hourly, it depends on the time scale of our study. And we consider the maintenance cost as a function of operating condition. For example, we say at time T1, we have a specific operating condition, we have a specific temperature and pressure, which results in this amount of maintenance cost. But when we go to T2, the temperature and pressure will change and it will result in less degradation. And when we have less degradation, then maintenance cost would be less, as you can see here. So here we have B star as a maintenance cost for time interval T2. And we go to next time interval, T3. We can see, we can say that, okay, we have a new operating condition, new temperature, new pressure, which results in much higher degradation rate. And when we have high degradation rate, it will result in higher maintenance cost. And as you can see here, we have much higher maintenance cost in comparison with T2 and T1. I can call it C star. And here we have D star. And as we have splitted maintenance costs to different intervals over time, then the sum of all the maintenance costs at each time interval would be equal to the main maintenance cost that we have. But the only difference is that all of these costs are time dependent and they are dependent on operating conditions. It's the really important feature in our framework that we consider maintenance cost as a function of operating condition. And the last important feature of the framework is that we try to find optimal operating conditions in addition to maintenance intervals simultaneously in our model considering degradation mechanisms. These are three features that we have in the framework of degradation-based optimization. Here you can see the conceptual uh, framework of the model. So as you can see, we have a process model. The process model is the same as any model that we use to simulate the behavior of our system. It's a simplified uh, version of our system to model the input output behavior of our system. Mainly when you want to model and simulate your complex system, you use this process system, the process model. And then we have a degradation model. In degradation model, we try to model all the degradation, not all, but the main degradation mechanisms that we have in a system that results in material degradation or performance deterioration. Uh, as I mentioned, we could have mechanical degradation mechanisms, electrical degradation mechanisms, electrochemical, chemical degradation. We have different type of degradation mechanisms. So when you have a system, first of all, you should go and study 
what are the main degradation mechanisms of the system that results in performance deterioration. When you specify that one, for example, you can say that mechanical failure and crack formation is the main type of degradation mechanism that I have. First, identify. And example, as I said, it could be, for example, crack formation. And then the next step is that try to model the degradation rate as a function of operating condition. Degradation rate as a function of operating condition. So as we said, we have crack formation. So how crack will grow, what, what's the rate of crack formation as a function of load, for example, when we have different level of load and with different frequencies, we have different crack formation growth rate. We should find that equation. And for this evaluation, we should develop a model, a degradation model. This degradation model can be data-driven or physics-based model. What are the differences between, or it could be hybrid, hybrid of data-driven and physics-based models. So what are the differences between these three methods? The first one, data-driven, it's based on all data that we have, historical data, or the result of some tests that we have performed on the system and we have a lot of data, we gathered a lot of data, and we try to use machine learning methods and other methods to derive the degradation rate as a function of operating conditions using these experimental data. So it's based on machine learning method or other data-driven methods that we use historical data. One of the disadvantages of this method is that we need a lot of data. So it re requires a lot of data and we should perform a lot of experiment or we should search for the data in industry or, uh, uh, or maybe based on some failure that has happened, accident that has happened, we should use those data and use data-driven models. The other type of degradation model is phys based on physics-based models. So physics-based models use the principal rules that we have for that type of degradation. For example, when we say we have a chemical degradation in our system, then we should have the reaction. See, consider all the reaction and try to derive based on all the equations and principal equations that we have for chemical reactions, we try to derive the rate of that reaction that results in degradation. So all the equations are based on the rules and physical rules that we have, physical chemical rules that we have in our system. One of the disadvantages of this method is that it could be very complicated in our complex system. Sometimes we don't have that much knowledge about the system to model all the physical rules. Uh, so it, it could be very complicated. And in that case, when we don't have enough data, uh, when we don't have enough knowledge to use principal rules, then we should go with data-driven. But in practice, when you want to develop a degradation model for a system, mostly you use hybrid models because we have some knowledge about the principal rules. We use that knowledge, we try to use that model. But for the parts that we don't have that much knowledge and it's like a black box for us, then we use historical data. So it's the hybrid model is a combination of data-driven and physics-based models. And mostly in practice, we are using the hybrid models. 
if I go back to the whole picture of framework, so we had the process model, we had a degradation model, and then one important module that we have is optimization model. In the optimization model, we have an objective function that specifies the goal of our study. For example, you have a power plant and you should see what's the goal of your study. You want to maximize the profit. You want to minimize the cost. You want to maximize the reliability or whatever. What's the goal of your study? You specify the goal and after that you can specify your objective function. In some cases, we could have more than one objective function. We can say, I want to maximize reliability and minimize my cost at the same time simultaneously. So that type of uh studies are they have more than one objective function and this optimization model is connected to our process model and degradation model that specify the constraint of our optimization model and as a result by having the objective function and having the constraint we could have our optimal operating condition plus maintenance interval. So we have the optimization framework, we have an objective function, we have a process model, a degradation model, and then we have some constraint, which is operation and economical constraint. So you can see that the main idea is based on optimization framework. If you're familiar with optimization algorithms, we have we always have an objective function, some constraints. And the last part is a solution algorithm that we should have. You can see that process model and degradation model are can, both of them are considered as constraints because there are some uh, equations that we have and can be considered as equal constraints in our optimization framework. So I'll start with the first part, the objective function. As I mentioned, we could have different type of objective functions in our optimization framework. One of them, for example, could be productivity maximization. So here we have power at time t, and we take integral over lifetime of the system and all the power times to time would be the productivity. For example, the unit can be this one. It's just an example. Or we could have another objective function, which is cost of electricity minimization. There is another equation for that that you can see that we have investment cost plus all the costs that we have over system operating lifetime, like operation cost, divided by the productivity that we have, which will be if I want to present the unit, it's this one. We could have another objective function, which is profit maximization. In the profit maximization, we have income minus all the costs that we have in our system. The cost includes fuel cost and maintenance cost. And the output would be profit, which can be in dollar. So as you can see, we can select our objective function based on the goal of the study. The goal of the study could be profit maximization, 
could be minimizing the cost of electricity or maximizing productivity. Or as I said, it could be a combination of these uh, objective function based on the goal of the study. Then the next part of the framework is process model. In the process model, you can see here that we have some inputs which are operating mode, fuel characteristic, ambient conditions, and other variables that we should have them as an input of the system to be able to derive our output. The output is system performance. We could have different metrics to measure system performance. It could be output power, it could be useful heat gener generated heat, or it could be heat rate or efficiency of the system. If you have done some modeling for energy systems or any complex system, you are familiar with this type of models, with the process models. Actually, it's transfer and translate your input to the required output that we have in our system. The next one is degradation model. So I mentioned that degradation model could be data driven or based on physics based models. And I presented that the first step is identify the failure. The second step is to develop that model. And here you can see, in addition to process model, we add a degradation model. So we have all them together. So we have a model which couple process model and degradation mechanism model. So what will happen? Still we have our inputs, we have operating mode, fuel characteristic, ambient condition, all goes to process model and degradation model. But in addition to those characteristics, we have operating time. So we need a timeline as well, because degradation mechanisms, they have a rate. So we need a timeline to be able to quantify the amount of degraded, for example, surface area or whatever. So in addition to all values that we have, we need a timeline as well. We need a time frame, And then we are able to, in addition to calculate the output power, useful generated heat, heat rate or efficiency, which were all the performance metrics at time t, we are able to calculate the change in these performance metrics. For example, output power deterioration, or useful generated heat deterioration, or heat rate increase, or efficiency decrease. So in addition to all those performance at time t, we are able to quantify the deterioration rate of our performance. I should clarify that we could have dynamic process models as well. So here what I presented was a static process model. But if we have a dynamic process model, in our process model, we have time as well. And using that time, we can see, for example, the change in operating mode, the change in, uh, the change in our other inputs, and see its effect on our performance. In the dynamic in the dynamic process model, by having the time interval, in addition to that, we, we are able to see the performance as a function of time. We are when we have the gradation model, we are able again to see the deterioration as well. So even if we have a dynamic process model, and if we don't have any degradation model for that, then we are not able to see performance deterioration. The next part is operation and economic constraints that we have. 
Uh, so based on the system under study, we could have different constraints. Like, for example, some systems work in a specific temperature range or pressure range. So those constraints goes into operation constraints, or we have some budget limits. So uh, we have a limited budget for fuel cost, for example, or for maintenance interval. We should consider all those constraints here as well. Here I've presented the framework in, in another way. You can see that in our optimization model, we have objective function and we have some constraints. One of the constraints is model equations that comes from process model and degradation model. Another one is model restrictions that comes from all constraints that we have in a system. For example, the operating condition should be in a specific range or our control variable should be in a specific range or we could have other constraints in a system as well. And then we have some initial operating points as well. We could have them. For example, we have the characteristic of our system at time zero, at the beginning of the lifetime of the system. We can derive these conditions based on the manuals which are provided for our device. If you go through, through the manual, you can see that some initial points and operating condition and characteristic of material is presented there. So you can use it as your constraint in your system and in your modeling. So in addition to objective function and constraints, we have solution, we should have a solution algorithm for our optimization model. So here you can see the flow of data. Uh, we start from operating and design parameters. So here we have a range for operating uh, and design parameters. For example, for temperature, we, we say that we should always operate at uh, lower 300 because of some material uh, consideration. Melting, for example, could happen. Or for design parameters, we have some constraints, for example, on length, it should be lower than one meter, whatever. With this range of operating and design parameter, we enter degradation-based process model. Here, there is a coupled model. We have process and degradation model. We solve both of them together and we derive system performance as a function of operating and design parameters. And then with this function, so this one is a function. And with this function, in addition to other constraints that we have, we enter the optimization model and we derive our optimal operation parameter through a duration that we have. For example, a timeline that we specify. And after optimizing that specified timeline, we go back and again, we do the same process and we find the optimal point for the next timeline. And we do it over and over again until we perform and derive optimal operating conditions for the lifetime of the system. So this process of optimization could be performed using any uh, optimization algorithm like genetic algorithm or PSO algorithm, uh, branch unbound, or it depends. It depends on uh, the type of optimization algorithm that you want to select depends on the complexity level of your equations, the linearity level of your equations. If all your equations are linear, it would be very different from a case that you have a nonlinear model for your system. Or for example, that sometimes we, we are saying that if we have a switch, then the operating condition is a binary number. It's only zero and one. For example, it's turn on and off a system. 
that case, in that case, as we have a binary number that should be optimized, then we select uh, an optimization algorithm that's well performed for binary values. So selecting the algorithm depends on the linearity level of your equations and of your model plus the type of variables that you have. You have binary or you have continuous number or whatever that you have. Based on that, we select our algorithm and we perform this loop for the timeline that we have. Uh, one important point here is that you can do the optimization for the whole lifetime of the system at once. So you can optimize operating condition for the whole lifetime of the system, or you can change the timeline and do, do it in different timelines. So it depends on the case under study, the goal of study, but it's possible to consider the lifetime of the system and do it just once. Then you don't, do not repeat this low process. It's only for one time and you will derive your optimal operating conditions as a function of time, for example, for the lifetime of the system. Now I want to present an application. And through the application, you can see how you can implement the presented framework to different case studies. So the case study here is solid oxide fuel cell, which is a highly efficient energy conversion system that transfers chemical energy to electrochemical energy and heat directly from fuels through electrochemical reactions. So <clears throat> here you can see the SOFC. We have an anodic and we have another cathodic part. In the anodic part, we have fuel that enters the section and, and the layers which we have that is in the interconnection with electrolyte. We have some reactions. We will have a, <clears throat> some reaction and on the cathodic part, we have oxygen. Again, here we have some reactions, and then we have ions transfer from in the electrolyte part, and we have electron transfer from the conductor that we have here, and we have electricity generation. Here you can see the detail of the study is OFC. So it's from Bloom Energy. Actually, it's a company working in manufacturing different type of solid oxide fuel cells. But I, <clears throat> I have selected one of them and based on the data presented in the manual of the case study of the SOFC, I, I got these inputs for my modeling purpose. So the input is, one of the input is the type of fuel, the input fuel pressure that we should have. And another input of my model is power output of the system, base load output, maximum load step, and all the rest are my constraints and input to my modeling and framework. So at the first step, you should go to the manual and the company website or <clears throat> all historical or data that you have from the system and gather all the information that you think it may help in the modeling process. You can use them as an input or maybe as the constraint in your optimization framework. Here again, you can see the elements of our framework. The first element was objective function. And here, the goal of my study is maximizing the profit over lifetime of the system. In order to maximize the profit, we should know what are the 
incomes and what are the costs of the system. <clears throat> Here, income is the power generation from the system times to the price of selling that power to the grid, for example. If I saw that you have distributed generation and you are a private company and you are able to sell the power generated to grid, there is a specific dollar per kilowatt that you can sell. Then when you have power generated times to this CP, then you will have dollar in that time duration. And if you want to optimize it over lifetime of the system, then for example, here I've assumed the lifetime is equal to this amount of hours, then by taking integral over all the lifetime, then you could have income in the lifetime of the system. And for the costs, we have two main costs. One of them is fuel costs, and the other is maintenance costs. If you think that in your system, you will have another cost for system operation, you should add it here. You should add the term here. But in my case study, I only have these two costs. So for fuel costs, I have heat rate times to the price of fuel, the cost of fuel. And for maintenance, again, the same thing. It's different type of, we could have different type of maintenance. Uh, and for each type of maintenance, we have a rate of degradation that results in that type of maintenance. I assume that that degradation rate times to maintenance cost would be the cost of maintenance in that specific time interval. And taking integral over the lifetime give me the whole maintenance cost over the lifetime of the system. The next term is process model. So process model is a model that we should be able to get output of the system by assuming some inputs. The inputs could be operating conditions or environmental conditions. So if we have these inputs using process model, we are able to estimate our system output. Here, <clears throat> I have presented some equations. I will not go through all of them because it's not the goal of this workshop. Uh, <clears throat> I've presented them here just for your information and know that this is one of the main elements of our framework. So for your model, you should go over literature or try to model your system based here as we have all the equation, it's based on physics-based model but you can even have data-driven models as well for your process model. But mainly they are physics-based models because based on the knowledge that we have about the system, we can derive the equations and principal equations and present the system model uh, in a more structural way, like physics-based models. And here you can see all the equations. Sorry about that. Another element is the gradation model. So here we, if, if here we want to develop the degradation model of our system, right? The first step I said that is identification of failure mechanisms. So I have presented here a part of an SOFC, a solid oxide fuel cell, and I've presented different type of 
<clears throat> degradation mechanisms that we have in the anodic part, cathodic part, and electrolyte. So here, for example, you can see that we have crack formation or other type of uh, degradation mechanisms. For cathodic part, again, we have structure changes uh, and uh, all other type of degradation mechanism that you could find based on the tests that have been done on the system or based on the historical data, failures, accidents, incidents that has happened, you should gather all those information and present all the possible degradation and failure mechanisms here for each part that you have. I've presented them, all of them here, right? Then the next step is to select one of them that is the main failure mechanisms in your system. Again, it depends on the uh, goal of the study. If you want to go in detail, you can consider all of them. But for my case study, I just wanted to have the main cause of failure and the main degradation mechanism that results in performance deterioration. And I didn't want to consider all the degradation mechanisms. It was a very simple case study. So I try to compare all these degradation mechanisms and their effect on the performance deterioration. And I found out that Uh, coarsening and oxidation of nickel particles are the main cause of uh, are, are the main degradation mechanisms and uh, the main cause of performance deterioration over a lifetime. So this part was only I mean, uh, the identification. I realized this is the main. Cause. The second part is that try to model it based on the available information that I have. So I went through literature and I realized that we for coarsening, uh, the, the coarsening depends on time and temperature and it happens uh, over time in our system. And I realized that we have an equation for that. For example, it's RTR, uh, equals to R max minus R zero one minus K times to T plus R zero. Here RT is the nickel particles radius at time T, maximum par uh, radius, initial radius, which is dependent on temperature and the initial again rate. So it happens over time. Uh, this T is time and this K is dependent on temperature, operating temperature of the system. That's it. Another one was nickel oxidation. So nickel oxidation will happen because of two uh, reactions that we have at the anodic part uh, that is because of the presence of oxygen and humidity at the anodic part that can result in nickel oxidation. Here you can see these two main reactions. So for each of them we should have a reaction rate, right? We can say that reaction rate of oxidation is equal to K times to C times to one minus. I equation, we have degradation rate as a function of operating and design parameters, right? The next step that we need is that find the relationship between degradation rate and design parameters. Actually, this part is a part that makes a connection between degradation model and process model. 
we can integrate these two models together. So again, I used uh, uh, some research and they had performed some experimental, uh, they had performed some tests and they derived that, for example, when we have a specific degradation rate, then we have not uh, nickel oxide surface, for example, this amount of the surface is oxide and as because of the oxidation, some parameters of my system will be affected here, for example, TPV and sigma. The nickel oxidation, so as I said, it's because of these two reactions, I derived the rate and when time passed, we could have the nickel oxidation of the surface. And then this part that we derived the relation between uh, the design parameters and the oxidation of the surface is based on some uh, tests that have been performed. So this was the second step. Now, the third step. I have some updated design parameters over time, which is again dependent on operating and design parameters. Now I will see its effect on the process model. If I go back to the process model, I can show you that we have CPV, TPV here, or we have multiple sigmas in different places. So when we have an updated value for these numbers, then we implement it here and we will have updated output because they are not constant. At the process model level, we assume these are constant. But when we have degradation model, we know that they are not constant, they are changing over time. We, uh, we consider it changes over time. Therefore, we have an updated performance, an updated output of the system. So here we have degradation-based model. We could have performance deterioration over time. And all of them are considered as our constraints to our optimization model. They enter the optimization model. We, I presented the objective function as well. In addition to that objective function, we could use different algorithms of optimization, and then we could have optimal result. For example, here I have used genetic algorithm. We can use other type of algorithm. So it was whole process, you can see that how I started, I started from uh, my objective function, then I went through my process model, then I presented the degradation, I tried to integrate these two models together, and then I implemented an algorithm, an optimization algorithm to derive optimum operating conditions. Here we can see some results of the case study. So in the graphs, you can see voltage versus current density and power versus current density. So the black lines are at the initial time and the dashed lines are after 10 thousand hours of system operation. You can see that if we don't want to consider degradation mechanisms, we are always at the initial time. However, when we consider degradation mechanism, you can see that after 10,000 hours, uh, how our power over current density will change. For example, 20%, 17%, and 15%. And the difference of the graphs are about the temperature, the operating temperature. At lower operating temperature, you can see that performance deterioration is much lower. But when you are operating at high temperature, then it's 
the performance deterioration over time is much higher. It's 21%. Actually, the difference is around 6% is so large number. And here is again another output for uh, performance deterioration over time that you can see as time passes, uh, these losses are due to degradation mechanisms. Here you can see a very interesting result. So uh, it is cell active surface area. So we have an active surface area that reactions will happen at that location. If you remember our solid oxide, oxide fuel cell, we have these two sections, which is the interconnection between anodic and electrolyte and cathodic and electrolyte. These two areas are the main part that reactions will happen. So here it's the cell active surface area. That you can see it's, it is decreasing over time. The reason is that we have nickel coarsening and nickel oxidation. When we have nickel coarsening, the particles grow in of nickel and in nickel oxidation, when we have uh, nickel oxide, then the characteristic is different. We have much lower nickel particles around that. Therefore, cell active surface area will decrease over time, right? But the interesting result here that you can see is that at lower temperatures, the degradation rate of nickel, uh, the degradation rate of cell active surface area is much lower than higher temperatures. The red line is for higher temperature. You can see that we have a very high rate of degradation here. If I want to show it's a, the effect of cell active surface area degradation and performance deterioration, you can see it here that over time, we have, uh, let's see, this one, the, here the black one has the higher temperature. So you can see that performance deterioration, I can use the black one. You can see that performance deterioration is much higher than the other cases. Another interesting uh, point that here we can say is that if we don't want to consider degradation mechanisms, we always are at the initial point, right? Because we don't have any performance deterioration. And if we want to do the optimization at this point and find the optimal temperature, operating temperature, you can say that this one that is in black, then this one that is in blue, then the third one that is in red are our power at these three temperatures. And as the power at the black line at this point is higher, then the optimal temperature, the optimal operating temperature would be the highest temperature, right? It's when we don't have degradation mechanism. But if we want to consider degradation mechanism that happens in real applications, and when system operates, for sure we have degradation mechanism. When we consider that, we, we can see that performance deterioration is much higher than the other ones, than the blue and red ones. And maybe if we want to model our system over time, sorry about that. Let's see here. Yeah. If we want to consider, for example, power generation over time, which is the integral of the surface, this area, for example, maybe we can say that the blue line 
has a higher uh, surface. There, there's a higher surface under the curve, which is kilowatt hour, or we can say is productivity. This is a very good example of the importance of considering degradation mechanisms in our optimization. Because you can see that if we don't consider it and do the optimization at the first point, it results in much higher performance deterioration and much higher cost or less power generation our system lifetime. So I presented that the objective function of my case study was lifetime profit. When I implement that objective function, I get this output. For example, for temperature, the optimal result is this one. For current density is this one. I presented a base case as well. In the base case, I didn't consider any degradation mechanism. And actually, in the manual of our uh, of the solid oxide fuel cell, this temperature and this current density is presented as the optimal point because it's the optimal point at the initial point of system operation, as I presented here, these three dots. And I tried to compare my result with the base case, which is presented in a manual, and try to see the result. Here we can see the result that uh, the red lines are for base case, and the black ones are for degradation-based optimal strategy. Uh, you can see that uh, using degradation-based model, we will start from much lower power. So at the initial point, I'm not able, for example, to generate 130 kilowatt. I'm able to generate around 100. I will miss this part at the specific time, at time zero, at time one. But when you are saying that I've extended my maintenance interval a lot, and as solid oxide fuel cells are considered as very expensive power generation system and energy conversion system, then it's very important for me to have a higher lifetime of the system and the maintenance interval, or it's not maintenance, mainly it's replacement interval. It's much higher than the case that I'm using the higher temperature because the degradation rate is higher and I have to replace some of the stacks of my solid oxide fuel cell. Here I presented some other results, for example, power generation that I will have in the base case or in DPO case and lifetime profit that will, I will have. Here again is another graph. Uh, I won't go through all of them in detail because of the lack of time. But the, in general, this is the output of the, one of the main outputs of my model that you can see that after the lifetime of the system, uh, there is a difference around $77,000. Uh, it's a difference in the profit and it's because of its accumulated profit. And the main reason is because of the extended maintenance intervals and replacements that I had in my model. So you saw that how we started from our optimization model. I had my objective function. Then I had the process model, degradation model, and other constraints. I implement all of them as a model equations or model restrictions to my model. Then I had an optimization algorithm, which was genetic algorithm. And I was able to derive my, uh, my optimal operating condition. So this process is, we could implement it and derive uh, operating conditions on, on an hourly basis. I have 
here, uh, I, I won't go through all the results, uh, but for the SOFC case that I just presented, there is there are some references here I've provided for you. One of them is this one, and there are a couple of more. Uh, that another one is this one. You can go through and you can see the result, the detail of the modeling there. And if you want to do an only optimization of your operating condition, again, is the same path. You should follow the same path here. The only difference is that your X values are will be derived on an hourly basis. And you do the optimization hourly and repeat the process again and again. And for that one, I have a case study on gas turbine, which is for a power plant that I've performed the same method uh, on an hourly basis that you can go through this reference for that one. There are a couple of other studies as well, for example, for organic ranking cycle system and for polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell. Uh, that I've implemented the degradation-based optimization framework, and you can see uh, how considering degradation in the optimization process of finding optimal operation or maintenance interlock can change these two parameters uh, just by considering degradation mechanism. If you have any questions, please do let me know. And uh, here is my email address. And if you want to implement this framework to your case study, and you have any other question related to the method or the energy system uh, that you want to implement on that, uh, don't hesitate and shoot me an email. Uh, I, I for sure can, will be able to help you. Now we can start our Q&A. And thank you for your attention for today. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I want to thank uh, Dr. Bahiskar for an amazing uh, presentation. I think that everyone probably was exposed to quite a bit. So they'll, if, if there aren't any questions right now, uh, probably it's just because people are processing all of the information <laughs> that you just provided. <laughs> so uh, one of my questions to you was around um, publications where they can refer to the work or uh, other links, uh, ways to connect with you at later points. It looks like in the last slides you provided that. Um, yeah. Are there any specific publications? You actually are very well published as well. Uh, so anything specific that you would point us to in terms of learning more about uh, the work you've just presented? Sure, so yeah, I presented in the last uh, slide a couple of uh, publications. I think four of them is for solid oxide fuel cells. Uh, one of them is for the other type of fuel cell, which is PEM fuel cell, that they can uh, uh, review. All of them are uh, considered degradation in the modeling, and it's degradation-based optimization. And there is one uh, other study that I have explained the method, and I've implemented it on the gas turbine power plants. That one, again, is presented uh, I think it's the second or third reference in the slides. So they have all the references and all the publications that I had uh, with different applications. And uh, I've provided my email address as well, so I can send the papers uh, if anyone is interested. Okay, fantastic. With that, we are almost out of time here. I wanna thank everyone for participating. And again, thank you again uh, Dr. Bahizgar for uh, the presentation and providing that in our special session. It's been quite an honor. Thank you so much for the great conference. Thank you.